Today, I will explain a concept that is such an important building block to understanding how security is handled on the internet today. This is called the RSA algorithm, which is recognized by its public and private key components. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. This building block is critical to the encryption of web traffic using HTTPS, as well as the idea of digital signatures. It is also key to a lot of encryption performed on the internet, whether connected to email or the new passkey standard. The new passkey standard, which I've tried to explain in several videos, is actually not based on biometrics, as many have assumed. Rather, it is actually based on RSA cryptography, and the actual traffic exchanged between the players are public and private keys, not biometrics. This algorithm, which evolved from another algorithm called Diffie-Hellman, was patented to the benefit of MIT in 1983. This is a very important technology to understand, as your safety on the internet is dominated by this cryptography system. So we better understand if it works or not, and if there are flaws in it. Let's dig deep into this so you will understand how common cryptography works to make sure you are protected on the internet. I will keep this simple and not be overly technical, though it is a very mathematical subject. Stay right there. Many of you have heard of cryptography of some sort that have the terms public and private key on it. One very common use is when you go to the internet and go to a website. What happens here is that your browser always checks if there is a public key certificate that is presented by the website you visit. It then checks if that certificate is validated by a trust authority. The certificate itself also contains a digital signature which is issued by a trust authority. So in website certificates, there are two parts, a digital signature and then there's the actual public key. I just want to make that clear. The verification methods used for digital signatures are based on mathematical formulas, so you can't just make this up. A trust authority, meaning some other entity, then vouches for the validity of the signature, and then the browser puts a lock sign next to the website to indicate that it has a valid public key certificate. Then, using this public key portion of the certificate as the input component for encryption, a message is sent to the website to set up a key for an encrypted communication. The target website will not see this pass key unless they have the private key associated with their public certificate. And the private key is used for decryption. If the two players successfully exchange encrypted data using the pass encryption key, then the user will be certain that the targeted website is authentic, and that a secure channel has been established. Not that you'll remember it, but this protocol I just described is called TLS, or Transport Level Security. The interesting thing to note here is that the initial exchange between your browser and the website is based on the TLS public key certificate. This itself uses the RSA cryptography that I will explain. Again, the main components of RSA cryptography is that the party can have an encrypted conversation with someone that has their public key. The public key is not hidden, thus it is called public, and it looks like this. This is an example of a 2048-bit RSA public key. Then there is a private key which is never revealed, but is generated as a set. You create a public and private key simultaneously. The secret ingredient to this tech, called RSA cryptography, is that the public can be used to encrypt a message, but only the party that has the private key can decrypt the message. Again, understand this carefully. Public key to encrypt, private key to decrypt. So it doesn't matter if other parties intercept the message encrypted with a public key. This is because without the private key, the message cannot be decrypted. 
This allows the encrypted traffic to be transported openly on the internet. I can explain the actual mathematics of RSA cryptography in simple terms. Diffie and Hellman, the two original people who initiated the development of this cryptographic method, found that if you use two prime numbers, very large ones, to come up with a product, meaning multiplying the two prime numbers, it is extremely difficult to figure out what the original two prime numbers are if you only know the product. This whole mathematical construct, which is the basis of modern encryption, is called the prime number factorization problem. It is extremely difficult, if not downright impossible, to figure out the prime number of factors of a given product, assuming it is a very large number. So if a message is encrypted with the product, the public key, the encryption is based on a formula that requires knowing the original prime numbers, the basis of the private key. By the way, the actual formula used in RSA also applies an exponent to the prime numbers and that is used in the decryption. The end result though gives us the concept of two sets of related numbers. One can derive the other but it is a one-way secret. There are other mathematical algorithms that do not use prime number factorization, like elliptical curve cryptography or ECC. We don't need to get into that, but the concept is the same. ECC is just a different encryption algorithm in addition to RSA. There are component numbers in a curve that can generate a value, but it is infeasible to determine those component numbers. Again, creating a one-way relationship between two sets of numbers. The main thing to understand with all these encryption algorithms is that there is a public key and a private key. The public key can encrypt, the private key can decrypt. Math makes that possible. That's the main thing that needs to be understood. Now, just having a certificate pair following a standard such as RSA is enough to initiate an encrypted session. The usual use of the certificate pair is for the first party to use the public key of the second party to encrypt a new key, and then the other party decrypts this new key. Then they can initiate a bidirectional secure conversation using another standard encryption like AES-256, which is called symmetric encryption. In symmetric encryption, the same key is used in both directions. The reason two different encryption schemes are used by your browser is that the RSA keys are very large and with the necessary parameter exchange has a lot of steps and is thus very slow. This RSA encryption is often called asymmetric encryption since only one party has a key. Then they convert to symmetric encryption where the passed key is the same on both sides so it is simpler. Now, this technology has some weaknesses. Most of it's solved in real life today. One of them is that if the public and private keys are based on a smaller key, then it would be easier to break using supercomputers. Nowadays, the typical RSA certificate is based on 2048 bits, which is far from being breakable using today's technology. However, some old uses of RSA was based on 1024 bits or even less, and those hopefully should no longer be in use. The main flaw, though, is that if some authority, let's say a government, forces encryption using a smaller bit size, let's say 512 bits, nothing in the standard prevents that from being accepted. This would theoretically allow the encryption to be breakable by government in this case. Anyway, this is not an issue in the Western world. Secondly, using the new quantum computers, it has been determined that an algorithm called the Shore algorithm can in fact solve the prime number factorization problem much, much more quickly. I'm sure how quickly this can be done is a secret. I don't think this is necessarily a technology that is available beyond three-letter agencies, though. And likely it is so resource intensive, even with a quantum computer, that I bet it is not used commonly. This quantum computer threat is likely the most dangerous threat to RSA cryptography. 
but it will have little impact on most of us who are not passing nuclear secrets since possession of a quantum computer is limited to very few entities. So generally speaking, this technology can be trusted for most regular uses, and we can be assured that our encryption used in everything from our encrypted messaging apps to HTTPS interaction to uses of password managers will be safe since all of these are reliant on the RSA cryptography. And also, most encryption converts to AES-256 symmetric encryption anyway, and that is currently not susceptible to a quantum attack. The second element of the use of public-private certificates is guaranteeing a valid digital identity. This is another part where the flaws are. In the internet world, the validity of a website is based on trust. As I mentioned before, a TLS certificate used by websites not only has the RSA public key, but also a component signature, which can be verified against a trusted authority. If the trusted authority says the signature is valid, then browsers assume everything is valid. But trusted authorities have not always been trusted. The old Symantec that owned VeriSign, the main trust authority of the entire internet at the time, began issuing fake certificates for domains, and being a trusted authority, they were able to validate those fake domains. Symantec is gone now and pieces have been sold. The new remaining company now goes by a different name. This is an example of corruption being present in this trust system. Another element of this trust is that computer operating systems, meaning Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Linux, to name the major ones, incorporate the trust authorities in their systems. And someone can change that. For example, an antivirus like Avast will deliberately modify the trusted authorities to make sure there is a fake authority that validates Avast certificates, and thus it can see your traffic via a private key they have generated for themselves, even though the traffic is encrypted. And this is also done by hackers. Now, this RSA technology is being used in a new way to support the new passwordless logins known as FIDO2 passkeys. The main way you recognize this technology is by the use of biometrics to log into Google or any other platform. I will explain more of this later, but let's understand the technology implementation of RSA here. In this case, your device needs to validate that the platform is valid. The platform also needs to validate that you are a valid user even without a password. This new technology accomplishes this by having an exchange of public keys between both parties. Note the difference between the website certificate and this new way. While the old way only deals with one public key, the one from the website, the new passkey method, requires public keys from both parties. So your device will collect the public key of the platform, let's say Google. Then you will also send your own public key to Google. By doing this, each can check if the other party has a private key. How? As explained later, each party just has to respond to messages sent to them using their public key by decrypting them using their private key. If both parties validate that each can correctly decrypt the message, then a login is initiated. The target platform can validate its digital signature through the usual means of using trusted authorities or CAs. But the user's trusted authority is the operating system. In the case of Windows, this validation can occur by using Windows Hello. If Windows can validate you to be the same user as before, then they add the validation to the digital identity. Windows Hello, of course, normally does this with biometrics, fingerprint or face ID on a Windows computer, though this can also be done with a hardware key. But again, to make this clear, the purpose of the OS is just to validate the certificate as being the original, that it is not being spoofed, plus, of course, the presence of the private key will be the added insurance. 
The only things exchanged between the parties here are the public keys and then the approval provided in the API by the operating system, which says you are the same person. Even though the operating system may choose to validate you using biometrics, the actual exchange between user and the platform is only of RSA public keys. The operating system is just functioning as a trust authority. I want to make sure this is understood because passkey technology is coming in late 2023. I'm already using it on Google and people are resisting my explanations of this because they think the biometrics are being passed to Google. It is not. The benefit to using this RSA cryptography to prove an identity is that I am not required to keep a phone number anymore by the platform. RSA cryptography validates the parties without using real identities. This is a very important benefit. I've removed any phone number association with Google. So in reality, this new method is completely pseudo-anonymous. The security is provided solely by RSA certificates. In later videos, I will delve into the biometrics element of the passkey technology in operating systems and to explain further what its role is in being the trust authority to ensure that the passkey is valid. Hopefully the explanation is helpful. Folks, my company creates products that are intended to protect our privacy. We provide phones that have no centralized control and are invisible to big tech. Our most popular device is the Brax2 phone running Brax OS. We also have Pixel phones that have Google removed. These are called the Google phones. We have a VPN service Bytes VPN, which is a stealth VPN in that it doesn't scream that you're on a VPN. We do not put thousands of you on a single server. We have Braxmail, which eliminates the metadata from your emails. This means no IP addresses and traces on your email that show where it came from. All these products are on the store on my app, Braxme. Come visit us there. The link is in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next segment.